Um, my name is Molly Sauter. I'm currently a grad student at MIT in Comparative Media Studies, and I do research at the Center for Civic Media at the Media Lab. Uh, this talk is going to be laying out a, a analytical framework that I've been working on for a while of the ethical analysis of activist DDoS actions. And Though distributed denial of service attacks have been used as a tool of digital activism for roughly the past 2.5 decades, the past couple of years we've seen this huge explosion of the use of the tactic and the popularization of the tactic as well as a sharp increase in the attention its use attracts from media and state actors. And all of this attention has brought with it a lot of criticism and a lot of sort of support from various people in, in the digital space, including digital activists. However, both DDoS's critics and DDoS's proponents seek to declare the tactic as a whole as good or bad without a nuanced understanding of the variety of circumstances and contexts that can render the tactic's use ethical or in unethical. So in this talk, I'm going to lay down the preliminaries for a framework by which to perform an ethical analysis of an activist DDoS action in individual use contexts. We're going to go through a brief technical and legal note, which I assume I'm going to be able to skip for this audience. Uh, criticisms of activist DDoS actions that have been been thrown at the tactic in the past. Then we're going to get into the ethical, to the analytical framework that I'm proposing, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I'm going to take this as I write my thesis, which this is. So everybody knows what a DDoS attack is, right? Raise your hand if you know what it is. Awesome, I can totally skip this slide. <laughs> uh, DDoS action, distributed denial of service action by which you seek to monopolize the resources of a server or other resource with your resources to prevent other people from using it. Good, we're happy, we're happy. <laughs> All right, brief legal note. Unlike this cat, I am not a lawyer. I do not have a law degree. I haven't studied law. I worked at a law school for a while, but that doesn't make me a lawyer. So I'm going to talk about legal things in this talk. Do not take it as legal advice. So DDoS actions and DDoS attacks are illegal in most, but not all, jurisdictions. In the US, they're prosecuted as felonies under, uh, section, under Title 10, Section 1030 of the US Code, which is complicated and which I won't read. But just so everyone is aware, and this does have a bearing on my talk later, these things are very illegal. And th this has severe repercussions for how organizers should treat them as they engage, as they engage with them in, in their protests. So one of the major criticisms of DDoS actions is that they constitute censorship. This is a very popular criticism among sort of quote unquote old school hacktivists like Cold of the Dead Cow, Hacktivism, and other groups like that, which have denounced the tactic as straight up censorship. Basically they say you are impinging the movement of bits on the network and that's wrong. We sh if we're going to be engaging in this type of electronic activism, we want to be encouraging the movement of bits on the network, not stopping them. This criticism privileges the integrity of the network and the rights of specific individuals to unfettered flows of information and it privileges that over political ideals of activism and civil disobedience present in activist DDoS actions. This criticism also raises very specific unanswered questions about who can engage in censorship. Can, in fact, non-state actors and non-corporate actors be engaged as censorious bodies? And while DDoS is, un is undeniably a disruptive tactic, does disruption of speech, particularly in contexts where the target has many other speech outlets, always equal a denial of speech? For instance, when this tactic is trained against a corporate target, while certain aspects of that organization's presence may be disrupted, their ability to engage in political speech through the press and other outlets is not. Therefore, the criticism that we are engaging in censorship by waging a DDoS action sort of falls flat. Though the criticism is appropriate in some cases, especially, against especially when it's used against organizations that primarily exist online, such as ISPs or independent blogs. Second major criticism is a sort of a, a revamping of this very old debate in activism, direct action or symbolic slash attention-oriented activism, which is better? And the answer is there, one isn't really better, they're sort of different. Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, one group that's been particularly vocal about this in the past is a group called the Critical Art Ensemble, which helped pioneer the idea of electronic civil disobedience in the 90s. And they've criticized groups like the Electronic Disturbance Theater for their use of DDoS in their actions, saying that the use is ineffectual because corporations and states are now far more adept at waging quote unquote media war with activists, and it is ineffectual when compared with direct action. In addition to just sort of being mean to attention-oriented activism for no reason, uh, this criticism ignores the fact that DDoS is often used as a tool of direct action, such as when it was used by the electro-hippies in 1999 against the intranet that the World Trade Organization was using during their annual meeting, or other groups that I'm going to talk about later in this talk. The, CA, the CAE's conception of DDoS also lifts the tactic out of the context of larger actions that it is associated with. This tactic is pretty much never and frankly should never be used as the sole tactic in a campaign. It should always be used in the context with other tactics and it gets its ethical and political viability from the context in which it is used, not simply because of things inherent to itself. Third major criticism, what is a successful DDoS action? Basically, it's really hard to take down a large corporate website with a all-volunteer manual DDoS action. If you and all your friends are really just sitting in your chairs hitting refresh a bunch of times on like paypal.com, you're not going to bring it down. So then what are we going to consider a successful DDoS action if we can't rely on downtime to be a measure of success? So there are a couple of different answers to this question. The first is we want to look at the value of the tactic as something which draws and focuses attention. And this is way more important now that it's become much more of a media magnet than necessarily it was maybe 10 years ago. Another use, another use for the tactic is the biographical impact on the participants and expanding opportunities for engagement and participation. If you have never participated in a political action and you get to participate in a DDoS action and you're in the IRC channel with all of these new friends who you didn't know you had, who you didn't know had the political views that you had and you, di who didn't, you didn't know were willing to participate in ways that you are, that has a huge biographical impact on you and it helps you consider yourself an activist and helps you move up the, ch the ladder of engagement. This enables what Ricardo Dominguez of the EDT calls a permanent culture of resistance, where resisting methods, modes of power and resisting oppressive systems is part of the culture and isn't simply something you do for special on weekends, but is something that you do all the time. And the value of this symbolic resistance is not necessarily its overt effect on the systems that it ostensibly targets, but rather its effects on participants and on the reflective fields that surround it as it occurs, including media and culture. Basically, DDoS acts as a tool for the revelation of what James Scott called hidden transcripts of resistance. It serves as an open action where an individual participants can join in a community of resistance with others. Moving on to the second major section, uh, the analytical framework that I'm presenting. There are four major parts of it that I'm going to talk about in this talk. I'm hoping to expand that to maybe five or six later, but not right now. Um, the first is intended effects and actual effects. Uh, the second is context within a greater campaign, which we've already talked about a little bit. The third is the technology being utilized in the action. And the fourth is the specific participant and organizer populations at play. I'm going to go through these one by one. The first is intended and actual effects. What I mean by this is what the group that is waging the action intends to happen by its use of the action, what actually happens. So there is, there's a good example of this from 1997. It's called the IGC Yuskal Heria Journal action, and that's Basque, and I totally butchered it, um, but I'm not Basque. Uh, basically what happened was there was a ISP called IGC, which was hosting a Basque newspaper publication, an online newspaper. And this was during a time in Spain when the Basques were not terribly popular. There was a lot of violence going around around Basque separatist actions. And a popular DDoS action was started by people who I don't know, so don't ask me, uh, to pressure IGC to take this website down, the, the Escal Heria Journal website down. People didn't like it. 
Uh, it got a lot of popular support. Uh, actually, several major national newspapers in Spain eventually published target email addresses for email bombs and other things until they eventually decided that was probably a bad idea and they retracted their support. Um, but the stated goal of the action was always to get the website offline. People didn't like it, they wanted it gone. Eventually, it did go down because IGC was flooded with these packets and mail bombs and it was horrible and it rendered inaccessible the websites and emails of their over 13,000 subscribers and they couldn't function as a business while this attack was going on. So they did eventually stop hosting the site but under firm protest. As an ISP, IGC exists primarily, in fact, entirely online. Removing its ability to function online removes the, its core as an organization and its ability to function. So the goal of this action was to remove content. By waging the action, as long as the DDoS was successful, the, the content was removed. So actually, the goal of the action was the permanent imposition of the state of the action. Its intended effects were its actual effects as it was occurring. And this fits very well with the criticism that we saw before. This was actually just plain censorship. This was people saying, I don't like it that you're hosting that content, therefore I'm going to make you not host that content until you don't host it anymore. <laughs> and so this is not very cool and is unethical and bad. The second example that I have up here is the, ED, is the Electronic Disturbance Theater Lufthansa action from 2001. This is an example where disrupting content does not equal silencing speech, as opposed to the example that I just showed you, which was depressing. So in this example, rather than removing content from the internet, the goal of this action was to raise awareness of Lufthansa's allowing the German government to deport immigrants using its flights. This was part of a much greater action called the deportation class action. While the Lufthansa website itself was rendered inaccessible for brief periods of time, the actual communications of the airline, its ability to fly in planes, maintain normal operations, and communicate internally with, it, with itself and with the media, remained for all practical purposes unaffected. So while the stated goal of the Lufthansa action was to draw public attention to a specific aspect of the airline's business model and through focused attention change that corporation's behavior, it was actually rather successful in that. The airline did eventually stop allowing the government to deport immigrants with its flights. So though the action took place on the internet, the effect it sought to have was not limited to and was not even really present in the online space. In and of itself, this action could not have achieved what the Electronic Disturbance Theater set out to accomplish. It took positive behavior on the part of Lufthansa for the deportation class action to achieve its goals, as opposed to the IGC example, which was designed to accomplish its intended, its, its intended effects by gross fiat. So the third example I'm gonna talk about is something called uh, Toy War, or the E-Toy Toy War campaign. Uh, the 12 Days of Christmas uh, campaign took place in 1999 and was an online attempt to draw attention to a legal dispute between E-Toy, which was a performance art collective, and E-Toys, which was a toy company, that was an, an, an e-commerce company that sold toys online. And they were fighting over the domain eToy.com. And writing about this is, is very common because it's e toy and then e toys. You have to be very careful. And so this action was designed to draw attention to that legal battle. But it had the additional effect of having a fairly significant impact on e toys' bottom line because it took place the 12 days before Christmas, which was the primary shopping season. And it did have a major effect on how their website ran. So though their main goal was this attention-oriented campaign, in targeting this e-commerce site, they were targeting the central purpose of their competitor. They were attacking, they were going after what they were, which is an online organization. At eToy, the art ensemble, eventually triumphed in the court case and claimed a role in the financial losses suffered by eToy's Inc. that occurred over the course of that action. Their stock price pretty much plummeted, which you can either blame on the bubble or the, uh, or the action, whichever makes you feel better. So in this instance, we have a 
combining of direct action and attention-oriented activism into the same action. The, sec the next part of the, of the framework is context within a larger campaign. Like I said, DDoS actions very rarely occur by themselves, and in fact, if they did occur by themselves, you would probably never hear about them because there would be no reason why that site you like is down. It would just be down. Like physical world sit-ins, DDoS actions must be embedded within a greater campaign of publicity and messaging to ensure that content disruptions are registered by viewers and passers-by as protest actions and not as mere technical glitches. Now, the EDT Lufthansa campaign took place within a context of a coordinated multi-pronged campaign, which included physical world actions at stockholder meetings, press releases, and the distribution of special seatback information cards on Lufthansa Airlines that explained what the protest was about. I don't know how they got them into the planes, but they did end up in the planes somehow. Similarly, Toy War was also embedded within a larger campaign of press coverage. They were covered by Wired, the New York Times, and the AP. And there were also solidarity actions and physical world actions at courthouses. So if you are going for this type of action, it has to be embedded within many other actions. This can't just be your sole activist push. You have to use it with a bunch of other tools as well. This is really, the technolo technology problem is a really interesting one. As I mentioned, it's really difficult for a purely volunteer-based DDoS action to bring down a targeted site. As a result, we've started to see the use of botnets, traffic multipliers, automated attack tools, and other exploits to bring the power of such, such actions in line with the defenses employed by targets. While the use of such technological tools doesn't automatically negatively affect the validity of these actions, the use of non-volunteer botnets is the one thing that is particularly worrying. And the other things do need to be considered sort of within a larger context. Volunteer botnets present their own ethical con concerns but are less immediately objectionable. Like marches, sit-ins, and other crowd-based tactics, DDoS actions gain their ethical and political validity from large numbers of willing participants. The use of traffic multipliers and exploits, while tempting to achieve downtime, undercuts claims by organizers that the actions represent a unified political voice of many different people. So, if, so as a, an organizer, you would have to balance the do I want downtime and press coverage, or do I want to remain true to the number of participants that I have and value their participation over publicity? And this is something that lots of organizers have to deal with. Non-volunteer botnets, such as those that were used over the course of Anonymous's Operation Payback campaign, in addition to volunteer botnets, they were used together, present a serious ethical problem the use of someone else's technological resources without their consent in a political action, particularly one that carries high legal risk, like DDoS actions do, is a pretty extremely unethical action. Moreover, it cheapens the, participa the participation of activists who are consensually participating and makes it easier for critics to dismiss DDoS actions as criminality cloaked in free speech. So, even though, again, it may be tempting to be like, oh, let's just rent this creepy ass botnet from wherever to bring down this site for five minutes, really not in fitting with ethical use of mass participation in political activism. This brings us to volunteer botnets, such as those that were enabled, those that were enabled by the hive mind mode of low orbit ion cannon, again, during Operation Payback. Participants could pledge their support to an action and then basically walk away. They could say, great, use my computer to, do to DDoS whatever you want uh, because I trust you and I believe that we are all fighting for the same cause. I'm gonna go walk the dog now. So they, pledge to support an action and place their computing resources under the control of the organizers of that action. This places on those organizers a strong responsibility to maintain open communication channels with participants and to not make significant changes to the operation of the campaign without the consent of those participants. Changing plans, tactics, or targets without the consent of the participant population constitutes a major breach of trust and really should not happen. This brings us to the final bit in the framework which I'm going to go over in this talk, which is different participant and organizer populations. 
The great thing about DDoS actions is that they are relatively easy to join, and they're fairly relatively easy to wage in the first place, meaning many of these participants in these actions are inexperienced and unaware of the risks they could potentially be, potentially be taking, like accidentally committing a felony from the comfort of your own living room. Therefore, it is incumbent on organizers to make sure that all participants have enough information to usefully consent to participate in such, such actions. And this includes, participation, this includes information about risks that they could be taking and ways to mitigate those risks. This was a very big issue in the fallout from Operation Payback when a during the course of that campaign, a great deal of misinformation was present in organizing channels, and the use of the low orbit ion cannon tool was encouraged despite significant concerns about its security. Training should be provided to participants in ways to mitigate risk, and support should be provided in the event of arrest or other negative outcomes. This is similar to the way sort of physical world activists provide training for their participants in the, we're going to go outside today, and we're going to hold up a bunch of signs and yell at some people. These people may yell back. These people may also try to physically harm us. If you're totally not interested in that, that's OK. We still think you're cool. There should be that type of effort to educate and provide different channels for participation for electronic civil disobedience in the same way there is in the physical world. There are two big things that I want to do with this model uh, in the future as I continue to work on my thesis. The first is I want to develop an analysis for state and state related actors, particularly uh, patriotic hackers, uh, and see how they fit into this framework and how the entrance of states into this area affects the ethical validity of these actions or whether we're just wandering full force into cyber war territory there. Uh, the second thing I want to do is adapt the framework from a reflective model, which it currently is, to a prescriptive model. So it will be more useful to activists who want to, say, organize their own DDoS campaign and want to find out how to do it effectively and ethically. And that's actually it. Who has questions? Dude who stood up first. No other questions. Uh, hi, I'm Mike. I'm from Poland. Uh, I was heavily involved in the anti-ACTA campaign in Poland. Mm -hmm. I was not doing any DDoSes. I was doing the you know subject matter work. You, you don't have to incriminate yourself in this talk. Yes. Uh, <laughs> But I can, right? Uh, <laughs> thank you for this talk. I mean, I feel, first of all, thank you for this talk because I feel there's much too little talking about ethics in the whole DDoS and hacking, basically, uh, you know, area. So thank you for this. Uh, second thing uh, that I, will, I would like to add to this talk is that um, I think the framework work, works quite well because uh, there, w there is a uh, criticism that I am going to make about DDoS campaigns right now that is already kind of handled in this framework. The criticism, uh, criticism is that while the anti-ACTA campaign in Poland was, you know, at full speed and doing stuff and people were protesting on the streets, suddenly Anonymous started DDoSing Polish, uh, Polish government websites. I remember that. <laughs> and this had, like, the exact opposite uh, effect. So I didn't see that, maybe it was there somewhere, but I didn't see that in your presentation, that you have to be very, very careful with DDoS campaigns because they can actually cause harm to yeah. the cause that you're trying to do. And I think there was, it was a little bit in the success part, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't think it was, uh, you know, highlighted enough that mm -hmm. you have to be very careful because there is this huge framework, you know, other actions that are happening and maybe, just maybe doing DDoS right now might actually harm because it will give the government, as, as was this case, the government, you know, the excuse to actually do bad stuff that you don't want them to do because they will say, oh, they're DDoSing our websites, they are hackers and yeah. we don't have to do anything good for them. So. Uh, well done, because the framework already kind of works with that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree that this, this tactic is right now extremely controversial, but people keep using it. And sort of my view is that as long as we're going to use it, we should at least be using it in some sort of reflective uh, uh, way in which we consider our actions before we just sort of do them.
dude over there. Uh -huh. Hi, I just have a question. Um, you said that um, uh, disrupting uh, maybe like a business which is just uh, relies on the internet is uh, unethical. And um, yeah, I just ask why you make this assumption. I would so made a different assumption. I would have said that um, maybe running an unethical business on the internet is unethical and disrupting it is ethical. So really good point. Um, yay. <laughs> Something that I didn't maybe not have made clear is that each of these bits of the framework should not be taken as a, oh, you didn't do that, therefore you are totally unethical, or that these should all be taken as sort of a big lump of stuff, which you can sort of massage and be like, well, you're 60% here on that, and 45% here on that, and we'll figure it out from there. So yes, you're right. And that's actually sort of one of the issues that I'm really interested in looking at in the WTO electro hippies example, because I usually don't like it when people are like, I'm going to protest you by making you fall off the face of the planet. That seems like a bit of an overkill to me. On the other hand, disrupting the internet for the WTO meeting at, at the Seattle World Trade Organization meeting, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of for that. That seems like a good use of resources to me. Um, so, I so I'm very interested in, in pushing those weeds aside and figuring out when exactly it's okay to basically attack the root of something as opposed to having a more symbolic protest, which I'm generally more in favor of. But you're right, I like, I like you. Um, we're just gonna switch to this mic and then we'll bounce. Yeah. I was wondering what your thoughts are on these actions impacts on non-participants. Like yeah. let's say you DDoS eBay and then other companies lose business or you say DDoS a healthcare provider and people can't access healthcare. Is that a factor in your mind? Well, you sort of brought up two wildly divergent examples of eBay, which means I can't buy my like awesome collectible Battlestar Gal Galactica glasses anymore and my healthcare provider, which means I can't get my tests from that thing that I had that may be cancer. Like those seem like very di divergent targets to me just to address that off the bat. Um, second point, uh, yes, collateral damage is something that does definitely need to be considered. Uh, but it is not actually sort of specific to DDoS in and of itself. Like if you stay just sit in at a lunch counter, I just wanted to eat lunch. Like. I'm not a bad guy, I really just wanted lunch. But you have a political voice and you're using it to sit in at this lunch counter. So that needs to be part of the overall consideration of do we think this is an appropriate tactic for whatever question is that you're trying to address with your activism at this time. Because not all tactics are appropriate for all questions. Yes? Hey, thanks. Okay, cool. That guy. Sorry, we had a question from the internet. The okay, internet hasn't um, gotten to speak yet. So I have this uh, kind of comment and question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very rich in material and I enjoyed it. But uh, however, you announced to talk about the ethics of DDoS, but you didn't say anything about ethics at all, except for some personal beliefs. Which kind of, what <laughs> kind of ethical framework would you actually suggest to use to analyze DDoS? So, the four f bits of the framework that I set out, and I'm looking at you because you were talking, not because you're the internet. Um, <laughs> ba <laughs> basically, you cannot just say that DDoS is ethical or unethical. You have, in, in the way that I'm looking at it, you have to look at it in the context of these at least these four aspects, possibly more. But you can't just simply slam your hand down and be like, nope, this one action, which actually has very little political value because it's just a bunch of bits swimming around a bunch of tubes, has real ethical value. So it's not, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people were gonna be like, she's gonna say that DDoS is right or wrong one way or another and then I will feel good and or bad about myself. <laughs> And sorry, <laughs> that wasn't what was gonna happen. Um, I'm far more interested in looking at these very nuanced questions of how this fits into political economy and protest methodology, which is far squishier than just saying this is ethical or unethical straight off the bat. I hope that answered the internet's question. Yeah, uh, I would also come back to the ethics. 
because uh, I wouldn't like to start talking whether DDoS is good or bad, but I think DDoS is a very interesting example because uh, it can uh, it can make us to question our ethics again. Because basically, unlike you, I believe that DDoS is really pretty violent act of censorship, but I think it can be very often justified because this violent act can simply uh, give us benefits that couldn't be made uh, any other way. So basically, I think that when we uh, think about DDoS and when we want to act at DDoS, we have to think about violence and uh, making violence an ethical, an ethical act, actually. So yeah, your comment. So violence is a pretty prejudicial term. Um, I prefer not to use it. You also notice I usually don't say DDoS attacks. I try to say DDoS actions because attacks is also a pretty prejudicial term. And I think a lot of the quote unquote violence inherent in DDoS has a lot to do with the inherent power structures at play among the people who are participating. Um, for instance, if I am a state government and you have a free press blog and you like to criticize me in your blog and I hire a bunch of people to DDoS your blog, that's not really cool. That's fairly violent. I am silencing your speech using my superior power as a big state. Um, on the other hand, if you are a private citizen and you and a bunch of your friends use FloodNet to attack WhiteHouse.gov, I feel that there's less violence inherent in that system. Uh, I would partially agree, but I think that uh, both acts are violent, but basically the ethics are different. So instead of avoiding the word, I think that we should just you know, think about the term. But that's okay. my opinion. The grad student in me wants to come up with a new word, but yeah. <laughs> Hello. As uh, the decision process, who attacks uh, which website at what, uh, what uh, point, any uh, uh, effects on the ethical part? On the organizing? Yeah. Um, I can't say that I do. Um, I think that falls into the purview of the people who are actually organizing these actions. As, a, as someone who is not an organizer, I can't really comment on the organizing process, having never sat in on one. Yes? Does that make sense? OK. We're going to switch back to this mic. Uh, aside from the um, coercive versus non-coercive-ness uh, of volunteer versus non-volunteer volunteer action, um, which maybe falls into the ethical standpoint, um, other than that, there's a, the question of liability. And uh, you know, if you're, for instance, uh, participating in a volunteer action, and you have a packet sniffer going on that network, then you can trace it back to, okay, you obviously volunteer to this action, there, therefore you're obviously culpable for those actions. Versus if it's a, uh, you know, box that's been compromised um, and uh, at play, then you know that person is theoretically not viable, uh, not liable for those actions um, because it was, uh, uh, you know, spread through a virus or trojan or whatever. Yes. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to point that out. Yes. No, you're right. That is a thing that also needs to be considered. But it also comes back to there needs to be more education among people who are organizing these actions to be like, hey, you know, you could be, you, you could be committing a felony. You could lose your house. Like, that's a totally a thing that could totally happen if you get arrested in the course of this action, as opposed to if you get arrested for chaining yourself to the front gate of the White House because you don't like the tar sands pipeline. You're really unlikely to lose your house in that instance. Uh, this is something that I have a huge problem with. I think the state response to these actions is completely out of proportion and bad and chilling and not good at all. Um, but until that changes, there just needs to be way more education and way more informed consent happening among the activist population who are participating in these actions. Um, in terms of looking to the basic sources of um, products used to make DDoS, uh, how do you think about the ethical responsibility of a company based in Redmond al allowing with their products to very easy make big botnets and use it for DDoS, especially this, con <laughs> this company is working in a country where DDoS is a crime, so they could be forced to change this very easily? That's a hell of a question. Uh, 
And I think I am going to politely decline to comment until I learn more about it, but we can totally talk about this not right now. <laughs> sorry. Um, do Why? we really? Oh, sorry. Was there more do to that? Why? Um, because I don't like to talk about things that I don't know a lot about and that I'm not confident talking about. I'm a grad student. I'm sorry. Um, do you really think that DDoS attacks will have um, a big role in activism in the future? Because I think um, the media interest in those kind of attract, uh, attacks is, is diminishing. And when I think of, I mean, you, you talk about this partially as a as, um, very um, useful means of activism, but when I think of DDS, I think of a few people sitting in their cellars and being bored in the IRC room and just hitting their LOICs just like they hit the retweet button and think they save the world. And I don't think that this will make any difference in the future. Okay, so you've rolled up a lot of things in that, including a veiled, not so veiled criticism of slacktivism, which I will also address in this answer. Um, you're right. Not a lot, there are a lot of DDoS attacks happening, not a lot of them get a lot of coverage. On the other hand, there are a lot of street marches happening, and not a lot of them get a lot of coverage, but people still like get their signs together and march in the street sometimes. Um, there's a concept in uh, social movement theory called uh, the ladder of engagement, which is basically like, it, it is what it sounds like. You start at the bottom and you work your way up to more and more complex modes of political engagement over a course of time. You can't just jump straight up to the top of the ladder because you're not Superman and you don't do that usually because you'll fall off and hurt yourself. Um, so DDoS is a very useful tool to get on that first rung. It's easy, it's low financial cost, it's generally pretty easy to advertise. It doesn't look like it will cost you a lot of time and money. All you have to do is really press a button and suddenly you are participating in this thing. And this sense of participating has a big impact on something that is called biographical impact, which is how you view yourself as an activist. And it's really pushing people over that edge to view themselves as activists in the beginning is very, very important. So while DDoS may not be quote unquote effective or successful as a standalone protest tactic, as a sort of, as part of a larger system, I think it is still useful. And I think it will probably continue to be useful. Just like retweeting someone saying something vaguely political on Twitter is also useful or liking someone's status or sharing something on Facebook or turning your Twitter icon green because you like the Iranian elections. No one in Iran cares that you turn your Twitter icon green. They don't even know you. They don't know that you turn your Twitter icon green. But what that does is that it connects you with all the other people on Twitter who turn their Twitter icons green. And you can see all the other people who turn their Twitter icons green. And suddenly, you're not just sitting there in your living room saying, I really support democracy in Iran. You are part of this community of green people on Twitter who all support democracy in Iran. And that's way more powerful to you as a person not necessarily to anybody else, but to you as a person, it matters. And that's important. That's important for getting people onto that ladder of engagement and making them feel like activists. And feeling like activists is just a couple letters away from being an activist, which is even better. Yeah. They're uh, clapping uh, for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm from Austria. Um, we have an organization in Austria. Uh, it's called uh, Austromechana. Um, and it got de dust. Uh, its website got dust uh, on um, uh, the 11th of, of, of May, 2012. And they didn't get the website on until now. Um, and they used this as an argument, oh my god, the internet uh, is so cruel and um, uh, they are so bad and, and, and we can do nothing against them. Uh, and um, they play with, um, uh, they, they have weapons we can't uh, do something about uh, uh, against it. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, in this case, um, the DDoS was the right tool to uh, uh, get um, 
Aufmerksamkeit, uh, attention. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it was helpful in this case. So uh, I th don't think it's the it's the uh, it's it's a good uh, weapon for every thing. Uh, and, and there there was not uh, enough messaging with it. No, you're right. DDoS is not appropriate for all cases. And given that I know nothing about your organization and didn't hear about that action, they probably didn't have enough me messaging. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sorry your website went down. No, no not my, my message. Uh, it, it was not, not my website. It was uh, from, from the people who want to have the uh, face button up Gabe. I don't know the English word. Um, it was the site. OK, cool. Uh, site. Hi, uh, what exactly are your parameters for deciding if a DDoS action was ethical, right, or wrong? I'm still waiting for this. So, so like I said, these, this is a very holistic model in that you look at a bunch of different factors and say, well, these things fell on one or either side of these different factors. Therefore, I'm going to look at it, squint my eyes, and say, OK, I think that this was ethical, and I think this, is, that this was unethical. Like I said, this is probably a much less scientific than a lot of people here were looking for. Um, liberal studies major, what do you want? Um, <laughs> so. This is not going to give you sort of a tick list for things that you can say, oh, we did this, oh, we didn't do that, therefore we're totally on the right side of God and the law. Um, instead, what I'm hoping that this system will give people is a way to look at these actions, to give them different factors to consider when saying, yes, this was appropriate, or yes, this wasn't appropriate. Because I feel right now that the debate right now is really a bunch of people being like, this is always awesome, and a bunch of other people going, this is never awesome, and that's not very useful. OK, but don't you think that's quite outstanding that you are the one who's getting to decide which is ethical right and wrong? You can also decide. I would no, love it if, so, if someone else would come up with a framework I, so that I, thought, I didn't have to do all the work. I thought it's your scientific study, so. Um, it's, it's not terribly scientific. It's, um, right, yeah. it's me reviewing a bunch of case studies right. and saying, these are the things that happened. This is where they fall on these different factors. And this is now what I think of this action. For instance, Lufthansa uh, EDT action, I think that action was ethical. I think it was ethical because it occurred within the framework of a much larger campaign, because it focused on a corporate website that didn't attack the, made, the, the central core of the corporation. It didn't stop it from communicating. It didn't stop it from responding to the action. It just made itself known in that way. And it did a great deal of publicity work. And in the end, it actually worked. The effect that it wanted to have in that they wanted Lufthansa to stop flying immigrants out of the country actually took place. And that also has an impact on the ethical validity of an action, which is why this is currently a reflective framework and not a prescriptive yeah. framework. Thanks, we had for, uh, well, good luck with your study then. Uh, there's another question. So my, my naive approach to, to judge the ethics of a DDoS attack would have been to compare it to usual demonstrations just marching on the street and because I guess one has a rather good feeling on what the ethics are there. You didn't highlight that too much in your talk. Was yeah. this on purpose or can you say something about so that? People really like, and lots of people really like to say, uh, oh, a DDoS is just a sit-in, uh, except on the internet. Um, I really don't like that comparison. Uh, I think it's really attractive because it sort of has a sort of feel, it feels like a sit-in. You feel like you are monopolizing resources in the same way that sitting at a lunch counter is monopolizing resources. But it's not in the physical world, it's on the internet. And frankly, these are two different things. Uh, we can't just say, oh, this is just like it, because it's not. What it is just like is it's just like a DDoS. It's not just like a sit-in. Um, disruptive tactics in both areas are very parallel, but they are very different. Um, 
And that is something that I want to go into much greater detail on, specifically both in sort of these socially acceptable disruptive tactics like sit-ins and street marches, but also the non-socially acceptable disruptive tactics like black block, black block tactics. I'd really love to compare that to other modes of disruptive activism online. Um, and other modes of disruptive activism and destructive activism. So that is, if you are interested in reading my master's thesis, I will have a whole chapter on this <laughs> that I could not fit into this talk <laughs> because there's a lot of that there. Um, but the instinct to fall back on the physical analogy is, I think, inherently damaging to the discourse of electronic civil disobedience and digital activism because you fall back on these tropes that don't really fit and then when people point out that they don't really fit you're sort of left with nothing when you say like that's not actually a sit-in that's a ddos you're sitting there going but i said it was a sit-in and you like sit-ins right and then you're sort of that's it so thanks i'd like so to push the the argument beyond that point thanks Okay, so uh, looks like we have no more questions. So thank you very much, Molly, for the talk.